Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we receive an update from congressional candidate Byron DeLear on the latest at the Westlake landfill in North St. Louis. That's where World War II nuclear weapons waste is illegally buried next to a subsurface smoldering event, otherwise known as an underground fire that can't be put out and is bearing down on the known site of this toxic radioactive waste. And we talk with Don Hancock in New Mexico on that state's decision to allow Holtec, makers of the infamous thin canisters for the dry cask storage of nuclear waste, to purchase land for a so-called interim waste storage site of those very same dry casks. Don provides many details lacking in existing stories about this decision by New Mexico and what it means to its people and the environment. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, on what's gone wrong this week with those aging rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information that got mentioned in all the, uh, excuse me, all of last night's first presidential debate. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 27, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Did you know that yesterday, Monday, September 26, 2016, was the UN's declared International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons? If you're in the United States, I'm not surprised that you didn't know that. At a General Assembly special plenary session held last August, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, The consequences of any further use of nuclear weapons, whether intentional or by mistake, would be horrific. When it comes to our common objective of nuclear disarmament, we must not delay. We must act now. Actions did take place around the world. In what was called Britain's biggest anti-nuclear weapons rally in a generation, tens of thousands took to the streets of London on Saturday, September 24th, to protest the UK's nuclear weapons system, Trident, and to call for global disarmament. The demonstration organized by Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, comes ahead of a parliamentary decision on whether or not to replace Trident, the UK's nuclear weapons system, which is comprised of four submarines carrying up to 40 nuclear warheads apiece. Labour MP David Lammy, in announcing his support of the rally, said, For me, the renewal of Trident is inextricably linked with the lack of resources and austerity we see in the country. He cited the closure of care homes, the closure of children's centers, no new services, and chronic shortages in housing before adding, I could not in all conscience vote for a renewal worth 31 billion pounds or more when this is happening. In Huffington Post, Cesar Hamarillo, a Canadian, wrote, We need to ban nuclear weapons in spite of Canada and went on to say, while every other category of weapons of mass destruction has been specifically prohibited under international law, nuclear weapons, by far the most destructive of them all, remarkably still have not. What is needed is a global legal ban on nuclear weapons, with specific provisions for the elimination of existing arsenals and a timeline for verified implementation. A UN-established open-ended working group included a recommendation supported by a majority of participating states to convene a conference in 2017 to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons, leading to their total elimination. But as Hamario points out, despite being a non-nuclear weapons state, Canada voted against the recommendation, along with most members of NATO, which is itself a nuclear weapons alliance. But support for that conference is growing. During the final session of the working group in Geneva, 107 nations expressed support for the convening of a conference in 2017. All 54 African nations, 
all 33 Latin American and Caribbean nations, all 10 Southeast Asian nations, Australia, Liechtenstein, Fiji, Nauru, Palau, and Samoa in the South Pacific, Ireland, shout out to Sean McGee, Malta, New Zealand, shout out to Kevin Hester, Sri Lanka, and others all supported this conference next year. We'll have a link up to the full article on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 275. Over to the disapproving United States, where Tri-Valley Cares, the Livermore, California-based nuclear watchdog organization, obtained documents revealing that hunks of uranium-238, also called depleted uranium, or DU, were unexpectedly found strewn around the ground at a currently operating open-air firing table at the Livermore Labs Site 300 High Explosives Testing Range. Employees were conducting soil and groundwater sampling in the summer of 2014 when they spotted DU littering the surface soil. The lab found 27 pieces of uranium-238 measuring 3 inches in diameter or greater, which weighed 80 pounds. Tri-Valley Cares is concerned about how much DU is still out there in finely divided particles. Nor is there any word as to how far those particles may have traveled on the wind. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz told the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee that the U.S. Department of Energy sees an opportunity in privately owned interim storage facilities to overcome the political impasse over nuclear waste. The DOE is encouraged by the novel approach of private initiatives to build interim storage facilities for nuclear waste. Based on a recent license application filed at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by waste control specialists and others to build an interim storage facility for 40,000 metric tons of nuclear waste in West Texas, Moni said the filing suggests a certain level of consent. Nuclear Hot Seat has dealt with the issue of manufactured and manipulated consent in episode number 265, where we interviewed Karen Haddon of the West Texas Seed Coalition. Again, episode number 265. Check it out. The New Mexico State Board of Finance has approved the sale of 1,000 acres to Holtec International for a possible consolidated storage facility for much of the nation's commercial spent high-level radioactive waste generated in nuclear power plants. We'll have more on this in our interview segment. And now, the nuclear reactor deck (laughs) and cover report, where we learn what's gone wrong with those aging rust buckets this week. At Diablo Canyon in California on September 20th, a steam line pipe whip restraint coupling sleeve was found not engaged. The NRC reports that with detached coupling, equipment in the area may have been vulnerable to damage if a pipe whip event occurred. In other words, shaking from an earthquake. This event is being reported as an unanalyzed condition that may have significantly degraded plant safety. (coughs) A twofer at Cooper in Nebraska. On September 25th, there was actuation of a main steam line isolation signal. A warning signal went off, but they say everything was okay. The cause of the event is under investigation, and fortunately, there are no indications of a leak. Also at Cooper, also on September 25th, the nuclear station was notified by the National Weather Service that the Schubert radio transmission tower was not functioning. This affects the tone alert radios use to notify the public in case of an emergency condition. This is considered to be a major loss of the public prompt notification system capability and is reportable. Estimated return to service time is unknown. The cause of failure is unknown. Fingers crossed there will be no accidents until after they fix it. And that's this week's Duck (laughs) and Cover Report. Interesting factoid. The nuclear warning sirens at the San Onofre nuclear power plant were operated by solar panels. I'll have a picture of one up on the website under this episode, number 275. In New Jersey... Health officials will distribute potassium iodide pills to those living within 10 miles of the Salem 1, Salem 2, and Hope Creek nuclear reactors. 
The problem is that KI pills only protect against iodine-134 and 137, not cesium, strontium, plutonium, americium, or any of the other radionuclides that can be released in a nuclear accident. But, hey, you might as well get protection for something, right? And a really terrific article, as always, from the esteemed Harvey Wasserman, How Nuclear Power Causes Global Warming. It appeared in Progressive.org, and we will post a link to it on the website under this episode. Over to Japan, where it's time for... Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound awake. Tests of dams surrounding the three melted-down Fukushima nuclear reactors that are operated by Tokyo Electric Power Company reveal high concentrations of radioactive cesium, and the element continues to accumulate. With no effective countermeasures in sight, the government insists that the water from the dam is safe, even though to local residents the government stance comes across as mm, maybe shelving of a crucial problem. An unnamed official from the Ministry of the Environment says, it's best to leave it as it is. He says this with full knowledge that in 10 dams in Fukushima Prefecture, there is soil containing concentrations of cesium over 8,000 becquerels per kilogram, which is the limit set for designated waste. But the ministry says, and listen for the wiggle words, that this situation does not immediately affect humans if they avoid going near the dams. So if you go near the dam, it's your own damn fault if you get contaminated. But the ministry argues that as long as high concentrations of cesium at the bottom of multiple dams in Fukushima Prefecture do not pose imminent danger to human health, there are no legal problems to the ministry refraining from taking action. No legal problems, but oh, the humanity. And that's why unnamed official at the Ministry of the Environment and the Ministry itself, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Internationally, India is negotiating with the U.S. Export-Import Bank for an 8 to $9 billion loan to finance six Westinghouse electric nuclear reactors. The mega project could open up billions of dollars of further investment in India's nuclear power sector. The country now targets a tenfold expansion in nuclear capacity, and U.S., French, and Russian companies are among those chasing the business with their tongues hanging out, thinking about the money they can make, not about the people on the ground. We'll be speaking with Kumar Sundaram of India about this in the coming weeks. In South Australia, plans for a high-level nuclear waste dump being touted by the government have found strong opposition at the ground level, according to an unofficial poll by a local radio station. Calls and texts by local citizens showed that 80% of the respondents were against the nuclear plans. Learn more about this issue by checking out Nuclear Hot Seat number 269, an interview with Dave Sweeney on all things Australian and nuclear. And in Scotland, the full might of Britain's nuclear arsenal has been brought to its knees, again, by 77-year-old protester Brian Quayle, who managed to hold up four gigantic trucks thought to be carrying nuclear warheads by simply flagging them down and then crawling underneath. It doesn't take much, and I can think of no better way to spend one's retirement. Well done, Brian Quayle. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, my ongoing thanks and gratitude to all of you who help support this show. Some of you choose to buy me a cup of coffee I will never drink, what I call the Starbucks donation, the equivalent of a cup of coffee with a nice tip to the barista. Some of you have chosen to buy that cup of coffee every month, a recurring donation that helps us plan promotions and improvements for the show. And sometimes you surprise me with something larger, which goes towards long-term planning and travel expenses so that I can go and cover events important to this community. Everything counts towards keeping Nuclear Hot Seat going, and your kind words help keep me going. So if you count on Nuclear Hot Seat as a dependable source for verifiable news on nuclear issues, along with knock 'em sock 'em interviews and a whole bunch of anti-nuclear attitude, 
consider donating now. And then do it. It's my birthday this week, and it would be nice to be able to move the tech on the show up another notch. That would be a great gift. We make it easy for you to donate. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can use PayPal, your debit or credit cards, or if you prefer sending a check, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com and we will get you a snail mail address to send it. Whatever you can do to help support this show, many, many, many thanks. Byron DeLear lives near the Westlake Landfill and has been involved with the issues surrounding it for years now. He's also been involved in clean energy issues as chairman and CEO of Energy Equity Funding. He's a columnist with Examiner.com and is currently running for state representative from the 40th District, which includes Westlake Landfill. As I stated in the opening, Westlake is where World War II nuclear weapons waste is illegally buried has been leaching out into the environment and is buried next to an underground fire that has been burning for more than five years from the Bridgeton landfill and is threatening to encroach upon the radioactive waste. Byron DeLear, thanks so much for being my guest again on Nuclear Hot Seat. My pleasure, Libby. Let's do a little bit of an update on what's been happening in connection with the Westlake landfill. I understand that earlier in September there was an EPA dialogue meeting. Was there much dialogue and was it worth listening to? Well, there's been several of these dialogue meetings that the EPA has sponsored, and many folks in the community have had uh, some pretty sincere suspicions about these dialogue meetings because of the nature of how any of the work product of these meetings uh, do not have a binding effect on EPA policy. And there were some who perceived that this was really a means to undermine the community action group, which is led by Doug Clemens, which formerly was considered the official organization that acted as a liaison between the EPA and the community's needs. And so the EPA hired this third-party mediator type company called Adamant Accord to conduct these dialogue meetings. And many in the community had boycotted several of these. However, four or five weeks ago, I believe, we had the third dialogue meeting scheduled and Just Moms, SDL, Don Chapman and Karen Nickel and Bill Otto and Senator Jill Shoup, Ed Smith and myself, uh, we decided to show up for this meeting. And uh, again, it was a case of discussing potential solutions for the Westlake landfill. And there were some pretty pointed questions posed to the agency, which were not really answered in an effective way. In fact, one of the issues that I brought was the peer-reviewed scientific study in the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity that had come out in December of 2015, the end of last year, which showed that there was inordinate amounts of radiological contamination moving off-site. And this was a peer-reviewed study done by Bob Alvarez, Lucas Hickson, and Marco Kaltofen. And I asked them very explicitly, I said, what is the EPA's disposition concerning this scientifically sound peer-reviewed study that shows just humongous seepage of radioactive material in the form of radon and lead-210 that it appears has been impacting the entire region, and I mean the entire region, not just nearby residents. Now, throughout the years, We have seen how the EPA has obfuscated the data and has attempted to minimize the perception of any real health impacts, negative health impacts to the community. In fact, they have repeatedly denied that radiological uh, material has moved off site. And this was uh, brought to light by Missouri Attorney General Chris Coster's office, who last year had conducted independent investigations and showed that there were uranium daughter products from this nuclear weapons byproduct material that has uh, been illegally dumped at Westlake that are showing up in the groundwater and in tree core samples off-site. 
So this shows very clearly that this material is an ongoing threat to the community. It's poisoning the, the uh, nearby residents. And this is precisely why this material needs to be removed and extracted in a full sense immediately. I was told by one of the EPA representatives this is five, six weeks ago at this dialogue meeting, that they would get back to me with their response concerning my question. Well, I haven't heard a thing back from the EPA. And this just sort of joins this long list of behaviors and actions conducted by this agency that has shown a gross disservice to this community. They have concealed important reports over the years, including a internal national remedy and review board opinion about the 2008 record of decision, which was an attempt to say that they could just build a clay cap over the site and that that would be a uh, fine way to remediate it. Well, this national remedy and review board document criticizes the District 7's EPA decision in a very methodical way, point by point, saying that this was a very unbalanced report and that, indeed, there are technologies available to fully extract the material. In fact, over 1,300,000 tons of radiologically contaminated material have already been removed from the region conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers. And just to backtrack a little bit here, the illegal dumping of 43,000 tons of radiologically contaminated material at Westlake, that material was sourced from the Manhattan Project, which was the secret government initiative to develop the first working atomic weapons. And there are over 100 contaminated sites in the region. All have fallen under the Army Corps of Engineers FUSRAP program, which is designed to contend with nuclear weapons-related waste, except for the Westlake landfill, which has been orphaned and excluded from that federal program designed explicitly to deal with weapons-related waste. Again, this is confounding for those of us who are not in the area and looking at it, that with the Army Corps equipped and experienced in taking care of nuclear waste, the EPA still has the mandate to take care of it, and we've known now for more than two decades that the EPA is not taking care of it. Why, in your estimation, is EPA or the powers that be clinging to something that they're not even equipped to deal with so that they are trying to figure out a solution when it sounds like the Army Corps of Engineers could just go into action and implement the solution or the best one that we've got. Well, it really comes down to a question of funding, in my mind. I mean, that is why this site was originally excluded, despite the very convoluted transactional history of the Atomic Energy Commission offloading the contents of one of the world's first nuclear waste dumps by auctioning off 125,000 tons of nuclear waste to a private entity. This is what occurred in 1962. And ostensibly, it's the nature of this private transaction that has put the Westlake contamination into a state of impasse where there is just a grotesque level of finger pointing and um, an attempt to sort of dither on the issue where we've seen this endless train of studies and reports. And for 43 years, we have really seen inaction on the site. Now, in 1990, the EPA wrapped its arms around the site and called it a Superfund site, put it on the national priorities list. And this is what the EPA is supposed to do. But in answer to your question, I really think it comes down to funding. I'll make the argument that if this site, if this contaminated radioactive site was off the Potomac River in Virginia or something like this, you know, uh, near Washington, D.C., it would have been cleaned up 30 years ago. So St. Louis is really getting the short end of the stick here. And this is despite the fact that St. Louis played this incredibly pivotal role during the greatest generation's effort to win World War II by processing nearly all of the uranium in the early years of the Manhattan Project, and in my mind, as uh, the candidate who is running for state representative where this contamination exists, I see the families and the community that is suffering due to the defense of our nation because the nature of this contamination was sourced from the national security obligations of the United States of America. And in that, the entire country has an obligation 
to shoulder the burden and make this community whole again. This is really the original sin here, is that you have this very threatening contamination where a tornado could hit it and release this material in huge amounts all over the region. And yet we have this callous system of government that is not being responsive to the needs of the people by removing this material. So we are continuing to just work every different angle and approach that we can conceive of to try to get movement on this issue. And that includes successfully getting a United States Senate bill passed in February, where Senator Blunt and Senator McCaskill said that the jurisdiction of this site should be transferred to the Army Corps of Engineers. And now H.R. 4100, which is the companion bill in the U.S. House, has seemed to have stalled. So we are continuing to attempt to get the uh, House companion bill passed so that President Obama can sign that transition of jurisdiction into law. There's also the time urgent issue of the fire at adjacent Bridgeton landfill, which is Mm. underground. It cannot be put out, and it has been advancing on the radioactive waste at Westlake Landfill. Certainly, I believe it was a year ago that emergency services said, look, this fire is now 800 yards away from the nuclear waste. We need to have emergency plans set up, which is one of the things that bounced your story out into the public. The last I heard, which I believe was a couple of months ago, was that they're now saying that the fire is only 500 yards away. Is there any further information and has any progress been made on either remediating that fire or putting a firewall up or doing something? So it's actually hundreds of feet, not yards. And I think what's important to recognize here is that throughout the EPA's stewardship, quote unquote, of the site, they have failed to do a grid-like comprehensive analysis of the site. Further, the landfill operator has attempted to block any comprehensive testing of the site. So the end result of that means we don't really know where the radioactive material is. And many different municipal organizations like St. Louis County, for example, have called for a grid-like analysis to be conducted at the site. So there are some independent observers that would suggest that perhaps the subsurface smoldering event, as they call it, this is the euphemism for an underground landfill fire, is already impacting radiologically contaminated material at the site. And it just befuddles one's mind to understand why when the EPA states in no uncertain terms, for example, they repeated this at the recent dialogue meeting, that they, quote, want to get the science right, unquote and yet refuse to do a comprehensive analysis to discover where the radiological contamination exists. And this kind of puts a lot of serious doubts into the folks who live here, if only because it just falls in line with a whole series of behaviors that they've done, not unlike their handling of the lead poisoning in Flint, Michigan, and not unlike the handling of many other toxicological sites around the country. Where do we stand now? I understand there was another community meeting. What actions are taking place on the part of the Just Moms, any of the other groups that are involved in St. Louis, and what can we do to help support them? Well, I'll tell you, Libby, in my walk as a candidate for the 70th House District here in Missouri, which includes the radiological contamination at Westlake and Bridgeton, I have been talking to so many residents, and I would say that upwards of 85% of the folks that live in Bridgeton, Maryland Heights, and Hazelwood, which is part of my district, are very concerned about the Westlake landfill. On September 15th, the Westlake community meeting was held like it is every month, and uh, this is the meeting that the moms conduct. It was broached the idea that there is a recall provision within the Atomic Energy Act itself 
that actually is the standing law of the land that currently orders the removal of this material. So there are a number of different legal approaches that are being examined. I've been working with Attorney General Chris Coster's office on this particular legal approach, and I've spoken about it before on your show. But essentially what the recall provision entails is it mentions that the Atomic Energy Commission, which was spun up into existence in 1946 during the transition from military control of the nuclear industry to civilian control, which is what the Atomic Energy Act governs, Uh, The Atomic Energy Commission has the ability to distribute, with or without charge, nuclear byproduct material for industrial uses, for research, for medical purposes. And it says very uh, simply that if any of this distributed nuclear byproduct material ever poses a threat to the public health, if it's ever mishandled and used in a way that's a violation of law, or if it's used in a way that's beyond the purview of the original license, that the Atomic Energy Commission shall recall that material. Now, we've spoken to a number of different legal experts who say that this holds water. We've also spoken to a number of law firms and uh, shared this information with the entire Missouri congressional delegation, as well as potentially responsible parties, including uh, Republic Services, the owner of the landfill, including the uh, successor to Cotter Corporation's liability. This is the corporation that did the illegal dumping in 1973. And that corporation is called Exelon, which is the largest nuke operator in the United States. And we've shared it with the inspector general of the Department of Energy, the inspector general of the EPA. And what we've heard is that from non-government sources that this recall provision holds water and it is still in effect. But the problem is, is that most private law firms are not interested in mounting a lawsuit against the government because of something that's known as sovereign immunity, which sovereign means king. So essentially the legal concept sovereign immunity means the king can do no wrong. And there is not a promise of a huge payout financially to take on the federal government and assert that this recall provision needs to be acted upon. However, if this issue is brought before a judge, that judge can issue an order of equitable remedy or remedy in equity, which would order an action to have the federal government actually satisfy the recall provision, which is designed to protect the public health and prevent any cascading expressions of uh, liability throughout the marketplace. So there's really a two-pillar aspect to a recall provision. It's designed to protect people from losing their life, and it's also designed to protect the marketplace from collapsing in on itself because of escalating uh, exponential cases of liability. So in this instance, the recall provision satisfied would mean that the material would be removed, it would be put in uh, specially constructed rail cars and shipped away from a county full of a million people, which is only a mile away from uh, sources of drinking water for the area. It would be shipped away to a licensed facility away from population centers and away from drinking water, which is what the 1,300,000 tons that the Army Corps has already removed, that's the destination of where that material has gone. In all this legal dithering and turf war as to whose responsibility it is, what strikes me is the ongoing suffering and exposure of the people who live in that area. If the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat wanted to take action to support the moms, the getting the Army Corps in charge of this, getting this under the Atomic Energy Commission's provision, where is the best place for us to put our energy so that we can support what's going on there? There are a number of actions that are uh, being planned and conducted by the moms, and I would just encourage your listeners to join the Westlake Community Facebook page, which kind of acts as a central repository for all the latest developments. But, you know, contact your local representative, contact your congressman, contact your senator, because these U.S. senators and U.S. congressmen and women have an impact on the budget for the Army Corps of Engineers and have an impact on the mandate to uh, clean up these threatening sites. You know, one of the things that I uncovered in my hundreds and hundreds of hours of research into this issue is the fact that it appears that the two main liable parties in this situation are the federal government and Cotter Corporation, which did the illegal dumping. 
And as I mentioned earlier, Exelon is the successor, the inheritor, if you will, of Cotter Corporation's liability. Uh, Republic Services may be liable for the underground fire due to some uh, oversights in their management of the landfill. But on a specific note, as being liable for the radiological contamination, I don't see Republic Services as being a prime liable party here. Now, I do have to criticize Republic Services for their efforts to block any comprehensive testing or block any movement, and uh, it appears that they are not necessarily interested in seeing the status quo shaken at all on this issue, and so they should be called out for that. But primarily, it's the federal government because this is nuclear weapons-related waste associated with the national security agenda of the United States. This is why this material needs to be cleaned up. If we cannot clean up the first waste associated with the very first atomic bomb, what can we do as a nation? And these are like heroes left behind enemy lines, the folks that are suffering next to this landfill. And sadly, the saga of our efforts during World War II are continuing to impact folks here at home. Byron DeLear, it is always great to speak with you and get a further update on what is happening in North St. Louis with the Westlake landfill and the radioactive weapons waste left over from World War II. And until we speak again, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Libby, keep up the great, excellent reporting and work that you do. You're an inspiration for so many. And thank you so much for pressing into our issue here in St. Louis County. You're a real partner in this effort to uh, protect the families here. Byron DeLear on the Westlake Landfill in North St. Louis. As the rad waste NIMBY battle, not in my backyard, continues to heat up, the key issue is who gets stuck? with the ever-increasing piles of deadly radioactive waste. As I reported previously in this episode, New Mexico has just approved the sale of 1,000 acres of land near Carlsbad to Holtec. Manufacturers of the thin canisters for dry cask storage used for storing U.S. nuclear reactor waste. In other parts of the world, Holtec makes canisters that are a whole bunch thicker. To find out more about what this story really means, I contacted Don Hancock, Executive Director of Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Don's been a reliable source of information for Nuclear Hot Seat on the problems with the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, near Carlsbad, New Mexico. That's where two accidents happened only 10 days apart. On February 4th, an underground truck fire, and then on Valentine's Day, the explosion of a 55-gallon drum of waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory, an accident that contaminated the interim waste storage site and shut it down, only 9,985 years shy of its 10,000-year use-by date. WIP has yet to reopen, so we asked Don about that, too. Don, the New Mexico State Board of Finance has just approved a land purchase for a proposed high-level radioactive waste storage facility near Carlsbad. How significant is this step? One is they approved the purchase sometime in the next 13 years. Holtec, the nuclear waste company, doesn't actually want to purchase it now. They want to just have a, an option to purchase now because right now the land is worthless. What they want to do is next spring, they're currently saying March, but previously they said it would be this year, but they want to put in a license for a consolidated waste storage facility to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission would then go through a few-year process, which would include public hearings and potentially public opposition, which I believe will exist. After all that happens, and if and when the NRC gives the license, then they want to buy the property. So the significance is, on the one hand, We have a worthless piece of property that a nuclear waste company wants to acquire, 
So that is significant if they were to acquire it. But nobody should assume that this land is going to the nuclear utility anytime soon, nor should anyone assume that it's actually going to be used for nuclear waste storage. Holtec is well known as the maker of dry casks for storage of nuclear waste, including what here in Southern California are the infamous thin canisters, or tin cans as I like to call them, which have no way to be checked, they are sealed, there is no monitoring of the content, and have only a 20-year storage life before they have to be replaced. That's what's being pushed through for San Onofre here in California. What do you know of Holtec's thinking behind what they are exploring and what they want to do at a potential high-level waste storage facility in New Mexico? They want to essentially use those same containers. If they can get them from wherever, San Onofre or other places, to New Mexico, they want to basically use those same containers, which they will say they want to store on the surface here for a while, in New Mexico for a while, until they can then go to a permanent geologic repository. Now, in the current scheme of things, as you and many of your listeners know, if, for example, waste would come from San Onofre to New Mexico and then go from New Mexico back to the storage site, which is supposed to be Yucca Mountain, Nevada, this would be lots of extra transportation that would make no sense and extra cost for somebody, presumably the federal taxpayers. So this whole idea is, in fact, not well thought out. But, yes, they want to use very similar containers. We won't know exactly what containers they want to use until they submit this license application currently supposed to happen next spring. But in general, in terms of what they've said publicly, is they've said, yes, they want to use these same canisters that they use at other places, not just at San Onofre, but also at other sites, and bring them to this site in New Mexico. Any clue as to how they're talking about configuring such storage? Are they talking about an above ground, just out there in the open? Are they talking about concrete bunkers? Are they talking about burying them, at least until such time as they can be transported elsewhere? I realize this is all in theory, but any sense at all of what their thinking is? Well, they want to keep them very close to the surface, whether they will leave them exactly on the surface or whether they might put them below the surface, again, that would be one of the things they will propose in this license application. They don't, of course, want to put them very far underground because the farther underground you say you're going to put them, the more expensive it is in terms of digging them out and putting them in and covering them up or whatever. And remember this is all predicated, this whole idea is predicated, number one, on a change of federal law, and number two, that the change of federal law would have the federal government paying for all of this. And so neither the change in law nor the change in the law to do exactly what Holtec wants is necessarily going to happen. As I mentioned earlier, people should not assume this is really going to happen because there are these various things that have to go. Notably, a significant portion of the New Mexico population opposes this plan, more to the point in terms of changing the law, the two New Mexico senators, Senator Udall and Senator Heinrich, have both said publicly that they oppose this plan. So, again, at this point, this is some people talking about what they may or may not do, But as I say, Holtec is not sufficiently confident that this will happen, that they want to buy the property. They want to have an option to buy the property. They don't actually want to buy the property. So they're covering a base that they don't even know that they have. But the relationship of all of this to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, this application that they want to submit next year, they can't just say, well, someplace somewhere in the 48 United States we want to build this site. They need to have a specific site. They need to say that they can acquire this site, and this 1,000-acre site in New Mexico is the site they want to use, and that's where they want NRC to give them a license. They are related things, but 
if for whatever reason they don't get a license or can't use the license, they don't actually want to pay any money for this site and they actually don't want to have the site. They don't really want to own the site unless they get a license so they think they can use it for this spent fuel storage. You spoke several times of the change of a federal law. Briefly, what would the law have to change to? There would have to be several changes. Currently, the federal law says that only site that the Department of Energy can consider is Yucca Mountain in Nevada, which would be a geologic disposal site. That's a bad site. But the law would have to change to say the Department of Energy, in addition to Yucca Mountain or instead of Yucca Mountain, needs to have surface storage facility for this waste. The law would also have to change to say rather than the Department of Energy having the site, it could be a private site like this Holtec site, which again can't happen under current law. The law would also have to say that the federal government is responsible for all of the costs of this facility, including, you know, the cast and the site and the transportation and the liability, among other things. So all of those things would actually require a very major change in the 1982 law and the 1987 amendments to the law that said we're going to do geologic disposal and in 1987 said we're going to do it at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. So the law we're talking about changing has been in place for almost 30 years, so it doesn't mean it can't change, um, but it means it's likely to take a while to change it, and it also means because there are players involved, both big people with big money in Washington, D.C. lobbying and a lot of people around the country that are interested in this that uh, make me believe there's a significant possibility that this will never happen. How is this proposed land purchase related to the problems at the waste isolation pilot plant at WIF, or is there a connection at all? There's no direct connection. It's a different site. The site is more than a dozen miles away from WIP, so they're very different in that regard. The only real connection is some of the people who support WIP also support this surface storage facility. The site is currently owned by a limited liability corporation that was set up by the two county commissioners and two city governments in the area, the counties of Eddy and Lee in New Mexico and the cities of Carlsbad and Hobbs in New Mexico set up this limited liability corporation. They purchased this worthless piece of land for a million dollars of their taxpayer money the taxpayers have gotten nothing out of this money that they spent, and the only potential buyer for this worthless piece of land is Holtec. And as I say, Holtec doesn't want to buy it either, but it's unrelated to WIP. The WIP site is 16 square mile federal government owned and operated site. This is much smaller, a thousand acres. It is privately owned by this limited liability corporation paid for by taxpayers of two cities and two counties. But the site we're talking about, this thousand acre site, essentially has nothing. It's a piece of land. It has no water. It has no utilities. It has no road. It has no railroad. Holtec is hoping, however, there's a railroad within four miles away and they're thinking they can acquire electrical power and water rights and other things they would need to operate this facility. So they're not very worried about the ability to acquire these things, but the site itself has none of those things that it would actually need as compared to the WIP site, which had more than a billion dollars spent over the years in terms of building facilities, road access to it, underground rooms, lots of things. So they're in a similar geographic area, but they're not at all similar in any other way. As long as we're talking about WIP, what is the latest on the problems at that site? The Department of Energy is still trying to say that they hope to open it for limited operations in mid-December, but the schedule to hit mid-December, they're more than 
two months behind schedule on it, which would mean that rather than making a December date, it would be more like February or March of next spring. And that may or may not be a reasonable time frame in terms of all the problems they have of getting the site up and running. And, of course, another thing that could happen in the meantime is there's going to be a presidential election, there's going to be a new administration in Washington come January, and how that administration feels about any of this obviously is unknowable at this point. But the facility has all of the major problems that it's had. Very importantly, from a public and worker health and safety standpoint, there's not enough ventilation to operate this highly radiologically contaminated underground mine. They have not solved that problem. Department of Energy itself says the earliest they could get back to the kind of ventilation flow they had before the 2014 accidents is the year 2021, in other words, at least five years away. And to meet that date, they don't really have a schedule and they don't really have a cost to do that. So it's very problematic whether this facility would operate and if it does reopen, whether it could operate in any safe manner. So whatever they are saying they are going to be able to accomplish by the end of the year or a few months afterwards, new administration permitting, does not sound like it would be the meaningful waste repository that it was before these accidents happened in 2014. That's correct. Department of Energy itself says their term they like to use is limited operations, not full or normal operations. They haven't exactly quantified what that would mean, but it apparently would mean less than a quarter of the amount of waste coming to WIP on an annual basis as was the case before. So that's significantly limited operations because the waste would have to be taken underground into a highly contaminated area to have even limited operation, the workers in the underground in the contaminated area would need to have Ebola-type protective equipment with full protection and self-breathing apparatus and things like that. And that's not the kind of uniforms you want to have in an underground mine of any kind, certainly not in a radiologically contaminated mine. So that itself shows that they know they have major problems with safely operating the facility. Anything else you can think of to add at this time? Uh, I think that's good. I very much appreciate your interest in these important subjects. That was Don Hancock, Executive Director of Southwest Information and Research Center. A link to his group will be up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 275. We have more about Holtec and their thin canisters on Nuclear Hot Seat number 250, where I interview Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety on this very issue. I'll link to that episode as well. Activist shout out. Given the world's recently elevated awareness of nuclear weapons and the dangers they represent, courtesy the tangerine nightmare candidate for president, <laughs> It's a good time to get people involved in fighting back against nukes. One step any of us can take is to talk with our doctors about Physicians for Social Responsibility, known as PSR. It's a group with expertise, a conscience, and enough verifiable medical footnotes to choke any pro-nuclear spinmeister into, hopefully, silence. PSR's work educating the public about the dangers of nuclear war grew into an international movement with the founding of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW. It was founded in 1980, and as the U.S. affiliate of this global professional network, PSR shared in IPPNW's 1985 Nobel Peace Prize, which was awarded, as the Nobel Committee stated, for spreading authoritative information and by creating an awareness of the catastrophic consequences of atomic warfare. PSR needs all kinds of doctors, MDs, DOs, alternative medicine practitioners, even your dentist, to be part of this global organization. So, hey, isn't it about time you saw your doctor and told her or him about PSR? It's easy to pass along their website, too, psr.org.
org. Here's today's final thought. The headline blared it out strong. Tens of thousands join UK anti-nuke demo, billed as the biggest in a generation. That's in the UK. So why not here in the US? Okay, we can say everywhere, but I'm here, so why not my country? As has been made clear to me while doing this show, nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors are not two separate issues. They are one and the same, a continuum of danger and contamination of our beautiful planet. Weapons-grade plutonium, part of the waste stream for nuclear reactors, is actually why those reactors were built following World War II, to create the stuffing for our deadly weaponry. But the government found it really expensive to build and run those suckers, so atoms for peace. What an oxymoron that is. Atoms for Peace was born in the 1950s. It turned the perception of nuclear reactors around 180 degrees, promoting the byproduct of plutonium production, the excessive heat, as a means of boiling water to turn steam generators and become the source of, quote, clean energy too cheap to meter, end quote. As an energy producer, it could be funded, ultimately, by we the people. And it has been ever since. And it's metered, and it's definitely not cheap. But it's that plutonium that's in charge of the nuclear industry, not the piddling, expensive, dangerous energy byproduct. We do domestic reactors to fuel the military weaponry, and in the process, expose all of us to badly remediated radioactive waste. Regular radioactive releases from reactors into air and groundwater, Depleted uranium used in bombs to poison populations the military-industrial complex that runs and owns this country does not care about. They don't care about the people who live around reactors, either. Now, I could go on and on, and to be honest, I do, every week on this show. But the bottom line is, reactors or bombs, nuclear is dangerous and needs to be stopped. So let's all do one thing this week. If it's post a comment online on a pro-nuclear spin article, or write an op-ed or a letter to the editor, talk with your doctor about PSR, or call a legislator, or send a donation, or talk with a neighbor, or, if you're of a mind to do so, pray. We all need to do whatever we can to stop all things nuclear before it's too late, and the worst finger of all is on the button. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 27, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, un.org, Huffington Post, commondreams.org, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN.org, patch.com, snl.com, nj.com, semissourian.com, longtime activist Myla Reason, tomudahl.senate.gov, progressive.org, mainichi.jp, abc.net.au, in.reuters.com the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the always excellent, passionately committed, highly motivated, and drop-live gorgeous souls in the anti-nuclear movement all over the world. The people who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are all invited to come on down and join us, and like us, and share our posts with your friends and family, and even that weird old uncle you don't want to see at Thanksgiving but have to. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Lee B. Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Lee B. Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded in 112 countries. Why so many? Because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear
Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.